What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on food shortages, and why does that matter? Well, uh, I'm not aware that we've seen a, a big impact uh, so far in terms of food production or food shortages. Um, I'm sure there are some, some issues uh, that have already emerged, but I'm not aware that this has emerged right now in any big scale way. Uh, but it probably will become a bigger issue uh, as the planet continues uh, to warm. Agricultural practices will probably have to change. Um, again, it's interesting, it depends on your point of view. For example, uh, in Russia, uh, uh, many Russians uh, look at climate warming as a good thing. Uh, because, for example, um, areas that are presently marginal for agriculture, uh, for growing wheat, say, uh, you say, well, now you're going to have a growing season that is four weeks longer. They're going to say, bring it on, right? So it depends, again, on your point of view. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on increase of diseases and undesirable bugs that now can live in areas where it was previously too cold, and why does that matter? Yeah, well, this is something you're already seeing, uh, is that uh, uh, diseases that you didn't see in one area, now you're probably starting to see them uh, increase malaria, for example. Um, yeah, as the climate changes and conditions, uh, uh, it warms up, uh, precipitation patterns change, uh, you are going to see the bugs, right? <laughs> going into different areas that they might not have been before. Uh, so this is all you know, part of the, uh, the many faceted aspects of climate change. It's not just that the planet is warming. All these other things change along with it. Very nonlinear. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on increases in storms and dangerous weather, and why does this matter? Yeah, yeah well, something I've already mentioned is that as the climate warms, the, the atmosphere warms, it can hold more water vapor, something called the clausius clapeyron relationships, understood for a long time. But with more water vapor in the air, it raises the potential for big precipitation um, events. Uh, for example, you've probably heard of the term maybe too cold to snow. Right? Well, there's truth to that, because if the atmosphere is very, very cold, it can't hold much water vapor. The big th snowstorms, things like that, is when you're getting nearer to that freezing point, right, because the atmosphere can hold more water vapor. Well, the same goes in for th summer thunderstorms and things like that. Uh, so as there's already good statistics out there that, uh, uh, for the U.S., for example, that extreme precipitation events are on the rise. Uh, very good statistics on that. And that raises the potential for flooding and things like that. Uh, think about hurricanes, tropical, uh, tropical storms. Uh, there's uh, evidence that the intense ones are becoming more intense because there's more water vapor uh, around and warmer sea surface temperatures for them to work with. Now, there's also the issues is that we've got a lot more infrastructure in the way on coasts than we used to have. So it becomes a difficult thing to figure out, well, is all this damage because the hurricane is getting stronger, or is it just so we've got a lot more people in the way than we used to have before? It's really a combination of them. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on melting ice caps or glaciers, and why does that matter? Well, of course, melting ice caps, glaciers, that's the sort of thing that I work uh, with being a climate scientist who specializes uh, in the Arctic, although I've done some things in the Antarctic as well. Yeah, if we, um, when we think about uh, the ice in the Arctic, there's really two kinds of ice we're talking about. One is floating sea ice. That is ice that is on the ocean. It's formed by the freezing of seawater. We're losing that ice uh, fairly quickly, but losing that ice doesn't change sea level because it was formed by the freezing of seawater. Um, if we're talking about um, the issue of uh, sea level rise, what you're talking about is the meltdown of the, of the Greenland ice sheet, Arctic ice caps and glaciers, the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, and all of these ice masses are losing mass, because now you're taking what was on land, water that was on land as ice, and dumping it into the ocean. And that raises sea level. The other part of sea level rise is what we call thermal expansion of the oceans. The density of water, interestingly, is not constant. It's a little lower when we warm it up, so it occupies a little bigger volume, and that raises the sea level. Both things are happening right now. The oceans are warming, and we're putting more water uh, into the oceans. Right now, the sea level rise is about 3.2 millimeters per year, something like that. Right? It's getting bigger, 
but it continues year after year. Um, the sort of estimates right now is by the year 2100, maybe you'd see something like three feet of sea level rise. Maybe, a little more, a little less, depends on the assumptions you make. Um, how important is that? Uh, it depends on where you live. For example, if you live in Miami, you're already dealing with issues of sea level rise on particularly high tides. It's going to get worse. Area like uh, New Orleans, uh, it's going to be a problem because even a modest sea level rise associated with a storm surge from a hurricane is going to cause big problems. Uh, so again, the impacts depend on uh, where you live. The Navy is very interested in the problem of sea level rise, and it makes sense because uh, naval bases are at sea level. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on ocean acidification, and why does that matter? Yeah, well, ocean acidification, this is part and parcel of uh, the absorption of carbon dioxide from the oceans. Now, the oceans and also terrestrial biomass, things that grow on land, are actually helping us right now. If we look at the uh, carbon emissions to the atmosphere, we can calculate that pretty closely. And if we look at what the observed rise is in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, it's only about half of what we expect. In other words, uh, we should expect the rise in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to be about twice what we observe, given how much we add to the atmosphere. Well, what's helping us is, because, is that a lot of that carbon dioxide is taken up in the oceans, and it's taken up by terrestrial biomass, things that grow. It's basically buffering us. Now, that won't last forever. There's limits to that. But the thing is, if we put all that carbon dioxide into the ocean, we acidify it. We turn it, we get carbonic acid out of it. Well, the problem with that is, is uh, coral bleaching issues. Uh, of course, that's partly a warming issue as well. Uh, but uh, calcifiers, uh, mollusks, and things like that who build shells, that can interfere uh, with that shell building. So there's a lot of impact uh, here from as ocean acidification that can certainly directly impact ecosystems, and that is going to eventually impact us. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on temperature, and why does that matter? Well, certainly when we think about climate change, what we usually uh, equate that with is the term global warming. And that warming, what we're really talking about generally, is the air temperature near the surface, about that high, it's what we call screen level. And we measure those temperatures all over the world. Um, and, of course, those temperatures are rising. It's uh, not an even rise. It's got a lot of squiggles in it. It's sort of like this sort of thing. You're going up, but there's a lot of ups and downs. That's the natural climate variability in the system. Um, and, uh, but we're seeing warming throughout the system. For example, 90, something like 90% of global warming is actually in the oceans uh, because the ocean is a very good reservoir of heat. The atmosphere is not. Uh, but uh, the atmosphere is it's something that we measure. We've measured that temperature for a long time. It's the, a measure of something that directly affects us in terms of the warming uh, and that it affects things like agriculture. Uh, but I think the point to be made here is that the warming, just in terms of air temperature, that's only part of what is happening. We're warming the oceans. We're acidifying the oceans. We're putting more water vapor into the atmosphere. These are all part of the issue of climate change. So just fixating on the temperature part uh, gives a very, very incomplete picture. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on topsoil loss and topsoil productivity, and why does this matter? Well, I'm not quite sure myself what that link is. It's not my area of expertise. I mean, part of the problem we've got is uh, the use of fertilizer, fertilizer use. Uh, we put a lot of nitrogen on fields, things like that. A lot of that is not even used. It just goes into our waterways. Uh, that causes uh, problems downstream, like the dead zone, right? And the Gulf of Mexico was related to this sort of thing. Um, now, when we look Back in the past, remember the old Dust Bowl, right, of the 1930s, uh, and that's because we had bad agricultural practices, uh, and that was coupled with a period of drought. Now, I think we learned a whole lot from that in terms of uh, uh, different farming practices. Uh, but, uh, oh, sure, you have a flood or, you know, big erosion event, something like that, that can have a problem. Uh, my understanding uh, of this is that the bigger issue is sort of the... Uh, 
uh, unchecked use of, of fertilizers, uh, nitrogen especially, that's really the problem, rather than uh, uh, degradation of the topsoil itself. What are the results of climate change so far in terms of its impact on water shortages, and why does this matter? Well, um, as I've indicated before, as the climate warms, the hydrologic cycle is going to change. It's going to become more intense. Now you'd say, well, the more intense hydrological cycle, you see you have more precipitation. Well, it turns out if you have more precipitation over here, that can lead to drought uh, over here because of the nature of the way the atmospheric circulation works. Areas that are already dry are probably going to get drier. Areas that are already wet are probably going to get wetter. Uh, and uh, we're already seeing some of these effects. If you look at something like uh, wildfire in the West, it's probably a combination of a number of things. Climate change and forest practices is usually not just one thing or another. Uh, there's usually a number of coupled, uh, coupled issues uh, at hand. Uh, so uh, uh, water shortages in that sense, um, Water shortages in the sense of impacting agriculture. Again, we're probably going to have to be looking at changes in agricultural practices as they uh, move along. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's not be gloom and doom about this. Uh, we, can, uh, we can get a handle on this. What are the very most powerful five action steps we can take immediately to stop climate change? Well, I'd say the five most uh, immediate steps we can uh, take, I would say uh, go solar in terms of your electrical production, go wind in terms of your electrical production uh, because uh, that's really just secondhand solar. Um, I would say eat lower on the food chain. I would say uh, energy conservation. And the fifth one I would say is change the mindset. Um, if we make it clear to our kids uh, and our grandkids that energy conservation is really a good thing, that helps. Uh, because if you say, well, you turn the lights off when you leave the room, or you turn the heat down uh, uh, when you leave the house, um, these are all tiny, tiny things in and of themselves, but they have the effect of changing how we think about energy. And if we're going to get together and beat this, we've got to change how we think about energy and energy use. And so a lot of that is just education. That's the fifth one, I'd say. What aspects of climate change are we most likely to notice first? Well, in terms of climate change, what we're likely to notice first, m myself being an Arctic uh, climate scientist, well, we're already seeing it. Uh, and uh, what we're, the most visible change uh, is, uh, for example, the loss of the Arctic sea ice cover, something I've studied for a long time. It's very visible. It's very visceral. I think a number of us are familiar with the iconic image, say, of a polar bear standing on a melting ice flow or something like that. Uh, but it is very visible. It's very visceral. And uh, the thing is, we'd always known that the Arctic was the place where we were going to see climate change first and where it was going to be most pronounced. And here it is. Uh, it's a case where we sort of hate to say we told you so, but we told you so. What happens when you explain this information to world leaders? Do they listen? Do they believe you? Do they care? Well, who, you know, do our world leaders care? Do they even listen? It seems that it depends on the leader. Um, and uh, the current leadership in the United States does not want to uh, hear this uh, because it is very inconvenient uh, because uh, you know, the idea is that addressing climate change is going to hurt us economically uh, somehow. Um, other world leaders uh, seem to have caught on uh, in terms of trying to combat climate change. Europe is way ahead of us. Um, it really depends on the person and um, uh, hopefully it won't get to the point where we have to have some catastrophic event for people to suddenly wake up. Sometimes that seems to be uh, what it takes, but uh, it seems to depend on a leader. But I see the momentum growing now. Um, I see that there's a shift now, uh, that attitudes are changing, because you can't ignore what is happening anymore. Uh, you can't uh, stick your head in the sand on this anymore. So I am uh, optimistic that we're turning the corner.